Good night. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. Happy wow. New Year. Happy New Year. Christmas is coming. It's coming again. It comes every year. Imagine that. I, I, you can't even stone me for being a false prophet. Again, Lord, it's just good to get together with brothers and sisters and worship you, for you are so worthy, Lord, and so wonderful, and such a blessing in our lives. Search our hearts tonight, Lord, if there's anything that is wrong, Lord, we just want to lay it down at the foot of the cross, and ask you, Lord, then to fill us with your spirit. Be glorified in this place this evening. We pray, Lord, for Israel, that you would uh, bless Israel. We ask for peace for Israel, Lord, and just so we know that you're in your heart. So we pray for you, Lord. So, again, have your way in our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
so
Well, who would think, whoever would have thought, 2024, what was that song, in the year 2025, whatever it was, will man still be alive, I don't know man, We're... I remember when we were kids, you know, and there was a, who was it, who was it, Orwell, or uh, 1984, you know, and never going to get, and then 1984 passed, and here we are. Time flies, and whether you believe it or not, we are one, that much closer to seeing Jesus. Amen. Every day that goes by, we are closer. Every second that goes by, I mean, it's coming. And we'll all be there and say, yep, it came quickly. But in the meantime, let's study his word. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. The day the law was given. The time the law was given. Exodus chapter 20. I guess I should turn my Bible to it too, huh? Too busy lollygagging around here. You know, history was made at Mount Sinai. Matter of fact, let's do this first. Lord, this is your word. Holy Spirit, if you don't minister to us, it doesn't get done. I got nothing to offer. It is your word. Minister to our hearts and in our, into our lives today. And 
Just make us more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. History was made at Mount Sinai. God spoke audibly to the children of Israel. They heard His voice. They sensed His presence. God spoke and He gave the law. Now we're going to do a little study here on, on the law. So how does the law work with us? The law. You know, it's kind of divided into two parts. There's the law of God. Then there is the law of Moses. They're both different. And both are given here. In, in, as we continue on you know, in, in our studies here. Jesus was talking about the law of Moses when he spoke about circumcision and the Sabbath day. He was talking about the law of Moses. He wasn't talking about God's law. He, it's, he says in John 7, 23, Jesus says, If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? And in Romans chapter 7, Paul talks of the law of God. He says, Romans 7, 22, For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. And they're different. The law of God is for all people at all times. And it's given in Exodus chapter 20. The Ten Commandments. That's what we know it as. We call it the Ten Commandments. The law of Moses is, is found in Exodus 21 through 23. Mostly in, the, in parts of the book of Leviticus. And it deals with civil and ceremonial regulations for the nation of Israel. Their customs, their traditions, okay, their stuff. Now the law of Moses will be enforced during the millennial kingdom. And we will be ruling and enforcing those laws with Jesus as he rules. The law of Moses, that's interesting. But we, we must understand that they're different. We as a church are not under the law of Moses. Men, we don't have to get circumcised. A little late, but you know. So you think, well, why even study or look at the law of Moses? Well, you know what? It gives us insights about Jesus and insights to living a good life. That's why we study it. it gives us rules. It shows us how to live. And God gave it audibly to his people. He spoke it to them. Where the law of Moses was given privately to Moses for civil regulations for Israel. He was on the mountain for 40 days when he got the law of Moses. Remember he was up there for 40 days and when he came down the people were partying down. Man, Moses is gone. Let's have a party. Let's make a few gods out of gold. Make a golden calf. Let's worship the golden calf. You, you would think they had heard God spoke. God had delivered them from the Red Sea, from the Egyptians. You would have think that, you know, maybe they wouldn't do that. So we all sit here and we go, well, they're sure stupid. Well, so are we. You wouldn't think we'd do the things we do today either. When you sin, realize you're just like them. Oh, I guess I am. The law of God was written by the hand of God. Right into the rock, the stone. Exodus 31, 18. And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he was talking to Moses, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. That's pretty tough. Fingernail. You could write right in rock. So let's look at it. Let's read the first five verses of Exodus chapter 20. Then God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God. Well, I guess I won't do that. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You know, he tells them, I am your, look at what I did for you. He, he reminds them what he did for them. I brought you out of slavery. I am your Lord God. Verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an idol or any likeness of what is on heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water underneath the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, 
visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me. He is a jealous God. Not the jealous like we are. It's not, you know, his jealousy is a righteous jealous. He's not jealous about other things. He's jealous for you. He's jealous for you because he wants you to do great and be blessed. That's what he's jealous for. Because he wants you to have a good life. That's why he's jealous. He wants good for you. Now, you know, you, when you read that scripture there, visiting the iniquity of the fathers, there's some really some false teachings about this going around for many, many years. They talk about generational curses or generational spirits. Uh, a lot of churches, charismatic type Pentecostal churches, they talk about, you know, generational spirits, generational curses and, and things like that, you know. And in other words, if your great grandmother was into witchcraft, that is why you're into those things today. It's been passed on to you, you will be sucked in. That kind of a thing. Because she was a witch, you, you're going to be a witch. What's so funny about that? I'm talking about, you know, like witchcraft, not like witch. You witch, not that, you know. I have not seen that taught anywhere in Scripture. I haven't seen it. Reading the Bible now for, let's see now, 45 years. I have not seen that yet. If you see it, you come and show me, okay? What this is saying is, it will have an impact on your children and great-grandchildren. It's going to have an impact on them. doesn't mean you're going to be, you know, doing that. But it will impact them. Ezekiel 18, 2 and 3 says, What do you mean when you use this proverb concerning the lands of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. In other words, because they ate sour grapes, you know, you're, uh, so the children are going to be like that. That's, they're cursed because of that kind of thing. God says, as, long, as I live, says the Lord God, you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel. Because my dad's a drunk, I'll be a drunk. Don't, use, don't say that again, is what he says. Because they're in drugs, you'll be in a drug. You know, whatever it is. It's, my sin is because of my parents. Because I didn't have a good upbringing. My dad wasn't home, and that's why I sin now. It's their fault. It's his fault because I didn't have a good dad. Now, I've shared with you guys before, I had a very dysfunctional family. If anybody has a right to blame their parents, I do. Because the way I was raised. I've shared with you guys, the wor I think I've shared with you before, that the worst day in my house when growing up was Christmas Day. It was the worst day of the year. That's the most fights in my, you know, that they were in. And my dad beat my mom up all the time. It, it, it was a... But I didn't know it was a bad childhood because I didn't know any better. I didn't know there was, you could have a good day at Christmas until I met Anna. And she told me that Christmas was supposed to be fun. I go, oh, really? I don't like Christmas because we never had good ones. So, you know, but you know what? I don't blame my mom and dad. You know, I did a lot of drugs. And people say, that's probably why he did it because, you know, look at that upbringing. No, I did drugs because I was a sinner and I liked them. That's why I did them. It was my sin. It was, my, it was not my dad's sin. It was my sin. Don't you dare blame your dad or your mom. Ezekiel 18.4 says, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. There's two different souls. There's a soul of the Father. There's a soul of the Son. There are two different souls. And if this one sins, they're going to die. If this one sins, they're going to die. Because this one sins doesn't mean that one's going to die, in other words. It's just like the same thing. of Because your parents go to church your whole life. They take you there and then you become a young person. You think you're going to heaven because you got, you got a little water dripped on you when you were a baby. You're not going to heaven because of that. You didn't even know what happened. 
Getting baptized as a baby does not save you, and too many people think it does. That's a lie from the enemy, fooling people straight into hell. And you go to church, you know, they made you go to church, you went, oh, I went to church, yeah, I'm, I'm going to heaven, I went to church all my life. Do you know Jesus? Well, I, yeah. But you don't have a relationship with him. Been so many people through my life that I met that went to church all their lives and ended up coming to our, to our church in the States. And I'm not saying our church is the best church in the world, but it was a solid Bible teaching church. And it's the first time they really heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and they went to church their whole life. They didn't even know what born again means. They, they didn't even understand. They weren't born again. They never were born again. They just went to church their whole life. Much like this village here, people do the same thing. That's why we need to share Jesus with them. As a matter of fact, most of the time when you talk to people in this village about godly things and about Jesus, they don't say the word Jesus. They say God. I very seldom hear anybody say Jesus Christ. Jesus is Lord. I don't hear that. And when we go out and we, if we don't proclaim the name of Jesus and we just say God, well, their God could be Satan. Or it could be another Jesus, the false Jesus. Or it could be a football team or a soccer team or a basketball team or money or an idol or musician. That could be their God. You say God, they don't know. You need to make the difference. Jesus. That was a sideline. I didn't plan on saying that. But it is kind of a pet peeve for me because I've been here 17 years now and I very hear... Very, you know, they don't hear anybody talking about Jesus. Because they don't know Him. That's why they say God, because they don't know Jesus. They think He's the Son. That He's not God Himself. So God is saying, I'm jealous for you, because I care for you. I love you. God is not out to get us, but He's out to love on us. He never gives, gives up on us. And he doesn't give up on anybody out there either. Not, ju not just us. Everybody. He doesn't give up. You know what? God visits you right in the middle of your junk. Whatever's going on in your life. God visits you. Jesus comes to you right in the middle of your stuff. He visited me when I was a teen and when I was in much trouble. I was doing a lot of drugs and he would continually pop up somewhere and remind me, that he was the Lord. And that's what he's saying here. He will visit us in our iniquity to the next generations to love on us. That's what he's saying and save us from our sin. You shall have no other gods before me. The first, that commandment right there. Well, that one only took about 15 minutes. We got nine more. No, they'll go quick. I'm just kidding you. Let's go jump down to verse 6. We're going to read now 6 through 18. We're going to fly. But, showing love, loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You know, let's go back to 5 and, so we can get into that, that scripture. He says, You shall not worship them, that's any other gods. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing love and kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Some would, some would say... Taking his name in vain is when they say God and then damn it. That's not just taking his name in vain. Taking his name in vain is, is, can be in so many different ways. Just by not revealing who it is. Or even, you know, just in slight, oh, Jesus. You know, I mean, taking his name in vain. Not, not speaking it in reverence when you talk about, about him. Don't do that. Then he continues on there. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor, do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner 
who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. The Sabbath day. The seventh day. You know, it, it is, He made us, human kind, to rest, have one day of rest a week. And, you know, and some of us can't do it on Sunday. You know, some would say it's Saturday. Some would say it's Sunday. But, you know, because of Jesus, Jesus is our Sabbath, we can have a day of rest any day of the week. Like most pastors that I know, their day of rest is Monday because pastors work Sunday. You know, back in the old days, you know, I don't think people do it much anymore. I guess they do if they're under the law. So how can you work on Sunday? You, they'll say that to people, not realizing that their pastor works every Sunday. Well, is he exempt? He's working. And, it, and most, you know, pastors, or a lot of pastors I know, take off on Monday. Some will take Friday, a day of rest. Now, myself, I either get Monday or Tuesday because I don't know what's going to happen. Somebody's in trouble or something on Monday. And, well, well, sorry, I can't help you because I'm laying around. You know, I, you know, I, I, you can't do that. When I was in the states, because we were so busy, when Monday came, I turned my phone off and left. I didn't answer my phone, and Miss Ann and I, we would go somewhere, go down to Reno and go to a movie and just get away. So, and have just a nice day. Doesn't necessarily mean you have to spend all day in, in the Word, but you should acknowledge God on that day off. You know, you should have spend a little time with Him. As a matter of fact, we're going to have, Miss Ann and I are going to have a day off tomorrow, so don't call and bother us. Because <laughs> it's our 50 sec, 51st wedding anniversary tomorrow. So don't bother me, okay? I'm going to go eat breakfast somewhere. No, you can bother me. I might not answer you, but you can bother me. <laughs> Verse 12, chapter 20, Exodus. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. You know, when it says that, it doesn't say, Honor your father because he hangs out with you and he's a good guy. It doesn't have any little asterisks there saying, well, only if, only if he's been around. Honor your father and your mother that your days may... You honor them as your father and your mother if they were good ones or bad ones. Just, you know, how do you, well, what do you mean? I don't even, they weren't even around. They, look how they treated me and, you know, you got all that stuff. And, you know, I've heard the stories of the fathers here in the village and a lot of you don't care for your fathers, maybe. Well, you honor them by praying for them. You can start right there. It doesn't mean you have to go over and you know kiss their feet. Just start praying for them to get saved. You don't. You don't never. You never know that God can change them. You were rotten until God saved you, and, and you know starts doing a work in you. You were rotten. You're still rotten. You just saved now. If you know what I mean. Maybe a little bit better, but. You know how your mind thinks. Come on, man. Come on. Don't, don't, don't go telling me. Well, you don't know that, Pastor Jim. Yes, I do, because I got a mind. I know how it thinks. How do I think that thought? That's the weirdest thing. How come? That's Lord. You, you know, I'm, there's so many times that, that I'm sitting around that to go, Lord, I, I've taken my thoughts captive to the Lord, surrendering those thoughts to the Lord. When those thoughts come up, whatever they are, you surrender them to the Lord. Lord, I just turn that over to you right now. I'm going to praise you and get rid of that thought. So you pray for your parents. Pray for them to get saved. And treat them nicely. Reach out to them. Love on them. I mean, the Bible says love your enemy. You can, you can love your father. He's probably not that bad. He's probably not your enemy. But if he tells you to love your enemy, he's obviously going to tell you to love your father and your mother. Okay, enough of that. Verse 13. You shall not murder. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, I think I'm going to stop murdering now. <laughs> Remember when Jesus came along and he said, You have heard it said that you shall not commit murder. But I tell you, when you are angry with somebody in your heart, you've committed murder. 
So there you go. If you've ever been angry with somebody in your heart, and you want them to be hurt, and you don't like them, you want to get them, whatever, you sin, you murdered in your heart, you've committed murder. That's what Jesus said. See? We're sinners. Verse 14. You shall not commit adultery. You shouldn't be sleeping around. Sex outside of marriage is sin. Flat out. Any sex outside of marriage is sin. That's all I'll say. Verse 15. You shall not steal. Well, I don't steal. Well, I don't steal. You know, I, 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 I bet there's so many people, you know, that in the States, I'm not going to say here in Belize, but in the States say, oh, yeah, I, I, why would I steal? And I say, well, have you ever cheated on your income tax? You stole. <laughs> have you ever been to the grocery store and they give you an extra change back? Ooh, yeah. You just stole. Have you ever taken a test and looked at the other answers on somebody else's page, stealing their answers? You stole. Well, verse six, you know, the, that's why the law was given. The law was given to show us that we, can, that we break it. And then and Jesus comes along and says, if you break one, you're guilty of all. Oh, gee, thanks. So I lied, so I'm guilty of murder too? Yes. But you probably murdered also, and lied, and stole, and cheated. <laughs> Use the Lord's name. I bet you. I bet you. Everyone in here in this room has broken every one of these laws. And if you haven't, you come and tell me, okay? And then we'll see. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Quit gossiping. Oh, really? They what? Oh, yeah, they're jerks. I know it. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. That's just one way of false witness you shall not covet your neighbor's house you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor or his guitar shouldn't, shouldn't covet anything that somebody else has just be thankful for what God has given you and where you're at God know, God's in control I mean in one Listen, some people got lots of stuff and some people got nothing. When you get to heaven, you got, you got everything. So what do you care now? When you get to heaven, you got everything. You inherit all things with Jesus Christ. Everything that is His is yours. What do you want to cover a guitar for, man? You're going to own a mountain and a lake and a sea and an ocean. You know, you know what I'm saying? In the village. I mean, it's all yours. We just haven't got it yet. He is our Heavenly Father. And He is going to give us an inheritance. You got it. It's yours. You just have to die to get it. Verse 18. All the people were... Then... then it says, all the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. See, when, when God was speaking, man, he, was, he gave him this audibly, but at the same time, thunder and lightning's going on and smoke's coming up. The mountain is shaking. It's just like a permanent earthquake. Whoa, thou shalt not kill. Oh, thou shalt not kill. Oh, yeah. and, and the and the people trembled. I mean, they were sh sh shaking because they were so scared. Verse 19, Then they said to Moses, Speak to us yourself, and we will listen, but let not God speak to us, or we will die. We don't want to hear from Him anymore. Tell Him to be quiet. You talk to, you talk to God. I, you know, I mean, they, we don't want to hear from Him. Moses, you speak to us. We cannot handle God speaking to us. The power of God is killing us. The glory of God is too much. When God speaks, it's, 
just killing us. What's the matter with them? God's speaking to them. Well, you know, put that in modern day terms. I can't handle hearing the Word of God anymore. It's killing me. I don't want to go to church or Bible study because I cannot handle it. I can't, I'm getting convicted. I feel guilty. I keep hearing what God says and it's killing me, so I'm not going anymore. That's why a lot of people don't go to, aren't here in church tonight. That's why people there aren't there on Sunday morning. Because when they come here, they're going to hear the Word of God. It's not me speaking to them. It's God's Word speaking to them. And they don't want to come back because they know they're not right. They're exactly like these people right here. I don't want to hear from God anymore. That, people that don't go to church, that's what they're saying. I don't want to hear from God. They're not going to tell you that, but it's the truth. I mean, I mean, you just think of your lives. Think of all of us. When I quit going to church, why did I quit going to church? Because I was guilty all the time. I couldn't handle hearing the Word of God anymore because I, I'm, I'm leaving. So I understand. I know. I'm, I'm not saying this just out of making it up. I'm saying it from personal experience. And we're all humans. We're all people. We're all common with the way we think and do things. So I know. If we're caught up in the sins of the flesh, we don't want to hang out and hear God. Let me watch TV. Let me go hang out with my friends. I'm going to go have a beer, man. I'm going to smoke a little pot, forget about things, zone out there, do a little crystal meth and kill myself. This saying, I can't remember if it came from Pastor Chuck, came from John Corson, or I don't know, every Calvary Chuck pastor I know, but this is what they, what a quote from all of them. This book will keep you from sin. Sin will keep you from this book. It cuts away the flesh. It's the sword of the Spirit. This, the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. It cuts away the flesh. Hey Moses, you go. We don't want to go. You listen to God. We don't want to. That's what they're saying. You know, you, you read the Word and, and you, you go, wow, well, it, it hurts, man. You know how many times you've come to church and you thought somebody told me about you? Somebody must have told me. I remember Kerwin and, and Kenneth and Shedden back in the old days when you know those, all those guys came to, to, to church here and, and, and they would get mad at each other because they thought, you told Pastor Jim. <laughs> right, Kerwin? <laughs> I didn't know nothing. They get mad at each other thinking they were snitching on each other because God is speaking to them, man. <laughs> Do you ever do that, Kerwin? Did you ever think that? Did you ever think that? <laughs> Poor guy, because you were because you were trying to walk with the Lord, so you're the one to blame. Oh yeah. Listen, have you ever exercised? I exercise my mouth, but you know, if I exercise now, you know, the next day, I, it's painful. But then you know, you feel better afterwards. You look better. You know, it's the same thing with the Word of God. It, it, you know, you study the Word, you go to church. It can be painful, but you'll come out better and you'll be better in the end. Because God's Word will change you. Verse 20 of Exodus 20. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has come in order to test you, and in order that the fear of Him may remain with you so that you may not sin. To test you. This is not a bad like a test that we think of it. You know, like he's testing us, are we going to fail? He's going to crunch us? No, he, it's, it's, it's like a test, like when you buy something new and you try it out. And you show it off. That's what he wants. He's testing us. He wants to show us off to people. Look at my son, Pastor Jim, how wonderful and great he is doing, you know? Maybe I should use Miss Anna, you know, I'll use her instead of me. He wants to show you off. He wants to prove you. Not to test you, but to prove you that you are His. Not to break you down, not to put you down, but to build you up. And the fear of God is not, you know, yeah, yeah, oh, no, 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 no. It's 
The fear is the awe and reverence of who he is. Whoa. Like, you know, we've been able, you know, we were able to see a full, a full moon lately, right? You know, we've been so clouded for about three months now. But I was out there and I look at the moon and it was just like, bingo, man. Oh, whoa, look at that light bulb up there. Stars were all there. Like, whoa, God, you're big. That's the fear of God. Whoa, that reverence. You made this? Wow. If you, if you want to have the fear of God, just go out and stand there and look at the stars for, stars for a while and think about who made them. Okay. That fear of God. A fear so that you don't... It's that awe and reverence of Him so that you would do the right thing so you don't disappoint Him. You, you, you reverence Him so much. You, 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 he's an awesome God like we sang. And you, it keeps you in that place of wanting to disappoint Him. That you wouldn't wreck your life. Verse 21 through 26, the rest of the chapter. So the people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. Don't you, wouldn't you guys like to have been there? I mean, wouldn't it have been cool? Now that we know what we know. I mean, probably then we wouldn't want to have been there. But, you know, to go back and go peek in and watch it, you know, like a movie there. Wow. You know, Hollywood just can't do justice. Then the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen that I have spoken to you from heaven. You shall not make other gods beside me, gods of silver or gods of gold. You shall not make for yourselves. You shall make an altar on, of earth for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen, and every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. If you make an altar of stone for me, you shall not build it of cut stones. For if you wield your tool on it, you will profane it, and you will not go up by the steps to my altar so that your nakedness will not be exposed on it. A few interesting things in this scripture right here. After they hear the law of God, they need an altar. They need a place of sacrifice. That's what Jesus taught. Showing us the law that we could not keep it. And that something is needed. We need forgiveness. We need a, a sacrifice for our sins. And he tells them here, don't make this altar fancy. Make it simple out of stones, earth, the dirt. So when you come to the altar, you're not looking at the beauty of it and how nice man made it. No, don't profane it with your thinking you're doing good works. Just get some rocks and put them up there for me. Make the altar out of just rocks. So when you come to the altar, you're not looking at the beauty. That, that's what the pagans do. They make these beautiful altars. You know, whoa, look at that. Kind of makes me think of some churches. The people... You know, I hear many people in Europe, you know, they, well, I went to Europe one time a few years ago and a uh, young lady was here. I got the privilege of going to marry her. So I went to, you know, they had, they had churches that were, had been built in the 1500s, 1600s and stuff in Germany. Wow. What a tribute to man. And you go in and there's stained glass windows and they're so tall and they're way up there. And it, I mean, it just out of this world made. I don't know how to explain it. Just the architecture is incredible. But you don't see God in it. I, I've heard people say, oh, it brings me closer to God and I see things like that. You're looking at the beauty of that, you don't even see God in it. God's prettier than that. Nice looking. You know, God's bigger than that. High ceilings. I don't even like stained glass. To me, it was actually kind of creepy. Because many of the places, they had the tombs of their archbishops and stuff. in On the sides, you know, they're all this long cathedral. You've probably seen pictures, right? Long, you know, pews, and up there is the big altar, and I mean, it's this huge thing, and the candles, and whew, all this ornamental carved stuff. And then along the sides, you know, they have like, it's all caged in, and the dead people are there. The, the archbishops, the priests, the holy ones, that they obviously idolize or something, Kind of like going to church in a tomb, you know? That was weird. 
And God, you know, God never asked for the temple to be built in Jerusalem. He never asked for that. He was in the tent, the tabernacle that they carried along. Remember the one? That's the one he told them to build. And then that last verse again, I want to read it one more time, verse 26. And you shall not go up by steps to my altar so that your nakedness will, nakedness will not be exposed on it. Be humble. Do not build steps so people don't see what you did. Oh, I did the 12-step program. I overcame it. It was me. Look what I have done. I went through the 12-step program. Me, me, me. I don't know, man. If God doesn't deliver you, no 12 steps will. See, in those days, they wore robes. They didn't wear underwear on them. That's what I heard. I, I wasn't there. And the higher they got up on their steps, the more it was exposed. When you down, look it up. <laughs> I will read the scripture. <laughs> and you shall not go up by steps to my altar so that your nakedness will not be exposed on it. <laughs> It's right there. I'm not making it up, okay? Their rear end would be exposed the higher they went up. Ugh. You see, when you complete it in your own strength, the program or whatever it is in your own strength, I did it, I climbed it. When you fall, people will see your nakedness. They'll see you exposed. They'll, they'll see... Your naked failure. So don't build yourself up because you're going to fall. That's what, what it's saying. Because you can't do it on your own. Have humility and realize, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy on me. I need you to get me through today, tomorrow. I need you to get me through life. It's you, Jesus. It's only you, Jesus. Keep your eye on the sacrifice, not the altar. Keep your eye on Jesus. When you come to, to church here, it's Jesus. You know, we, we have the cross up there, but it's not the cross. It was who hung on that cross. It's the cross is the place we go back to. That he, when He hung there, we can put our garbage at the foot of the cross. But, but we don't worship the cross. Sometimes that song kind of bothers me, you know. On the old hill far away, so, and I love that old cross. I, I, I can understand it, but sometimes I think we can make it into an idol. Even the cross. It's who was on it. But it's not on it anymore. That's the problem with some religions. You'll see on some of the crosses, Jesus is still hanging there because they're still crucifying Him. No, man, He's off it. He went in the grave and He came up. He's alive. He's not on the cross anymore. He's alive. Well. There we go. We got the commandments. That's a good little chapter. And we'll continue on. We'll be getting more of the law as we continue on these next weeks. So let's pray. Lord, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Ten Commandments and how they point to our need for a Savior. And it's you, Jesus. It's you who we love. It's you who we serve. It's you who has done everything for us, Lord. There's nothing we can do but surrender our hearts and our lives to you. And tonight, even once again, Lord, here we are. Take us. We are yours. We believe you shed your blood on the cross for our sin. And that, Lord, you went in that grave, but you came out three days later and you come and live in us and you give us new life. Let us proclaim that message in 2024 to everyone who sees us, Lord. Let them see Jesus, the Christ, in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys. Well, God bless you. If you don't mind, put, help put away the chairs and... We'll see you sometime this week or Sunday. Thanks, Margaret.